I'm very thankful for the children that are in the room today. We had several that were baptized, obviously, just a few minutes ago. But uh, I always, I always love it when, the, when, when the kids are here. And it's not just this group down here that I probably shouldn't be calling kids, uh, but uh, other other children. If you're, if you're under the, if you're, what's the, if you're, if you're under the age of 12, will you stand so we can cheer for you real fast? We're glad you're here. Under the age of 12. Yeah, yeah. There we go. <laughs> if you act like you're under the age of 12 please keep your seat uh, we've been studying in the book of Hebrews for several Sundays and so I'll try to make sure that for our students that are here today that have not been here uh explain where we've been so far and where we're getting ready to go today we've learned in the book of hebrews about the supremacy or the superiority of christ meaning that christ is above everything that's the idea that's really the whole idea of the book of hebrews by the way he he is above all he is preeminent he's superior his word what he says is his word is greater than the word of prophets his word is greater than the word of angels. We read that Christ is superior even to the word of Moses, which includes all of the law. When, they say, when, when, you, when a New Testament writer references Moses or the words of Moses, they're referencing the law, specifically the first five books of the Old Testament, the Pentateuch. His word is superior to that of Moses. We've heard... Some things like verbs with adverbs. Well, students, you should all you know, know what adverbs are. Those are how we do the things we do. And so we, we had a message where we heard that we were supposed to hold firmly to our faith, to our faith. We were supposed to come boldly. We were supposed to trust obediently. And then last week, just when the writer of Hebrews was getting ready sort of to fill us in on a not really a secret, but he was going to share something very special with us in this letter. He was going to share something about this person named Melchizedek. And just as the writer of Hebrews was getting ready to, to let us know what that's all about, he stopped and said, wait a minute, before I can tell you about Melchizedek, I have to, I have to talk to you about being willing to learn hard things. And he used this concept of, he said, you're, you're like little babies that drink milk all the time. And that will bring some form of nourishment, but as you grow up, you don't just drink milk. Even for those students that stood, uh, I think I only saw one that might still be on a bottle. Uh, <laughs> that, that child was being waved in the air. But, uh, but even, even these young children under the age of 12, you don't drink milk all the time. You, you eat meat. You eat sandwiches. You eat nutritious meals, hopefully. But you eat other things besides just drinking milk out of a bottle and so you're saying hey there's some things that are hard there's some things that are tougher there are some things that if we're not careful we will choke on as we try to eat them as we try to understand them and the concept is when we're talking about eating we're not talking about literally eating we're talking about understanding ideas we're talking about learning lessons that's what we're eating is the lesson that we're learning. And the writer of Hebrews is saying some, some things are just very hard to understand. So before I explain to you about this person named Melchizedek, before I break that out for you, I want you to make up your mind that you're going to pay attention. You're really going to listen. You're really going to try. Let's get past some of the basic things. So he picks up in chapter 7 by saying this. This Melchizedek... So he's on it now. He's gonna, we're, we're, we're digging in. This Melchizedek was king of the city of Salem and also a priest of God Most High. When Abraham was returning home after winning a great battle against the kings, Melchizedek met him and blessed him. Then Abraham took a tenth of all he had captured in battle and gave it to Melchizedek. The name Melchizedek means king of justice and king of Salem means king of peace. There is no record of his father or mother or any of his ancestors, no beginning or end to his life. He remains a priest forever, resembling the Son of God. Consider then how great this Melchizedek was. Even Abraham. 
Now, this is the first time he's dropped Abraham's name. <laughs> in, in Hebrew worship, in Jewish worship, there are three names that are just sort of stand above every other, every other name. One is David, King David, the greatest king. One is Moses, the great lawgiver. And the other one is Abraham, the father. He was the, where this family, this huge group of descendants, where it, where it started with him. It was the promise, the conversation, the covenant that God had with Abraham. It started with him. So he's rattling their cage with this letter. Everybody know what rattling the cage means? <laughs> he's, he's getting their attention. He said, hey, listen. It's the first time we're seeing Abraham in this way. Even Abraham, the great patriarch, that means father, the great patriarch, you can go back to that verse. Even Abraham, the great patriarch of Israel, recognized this, how great Melchizedek was, by giving him a tenth of what he had taken in battle. First of all, notice that tithing doesn't begin with the law. That's not what this message is about today, but I thought it'd be a shame to read this and not at least highlight that the idea of taking 10% of your income as a matter of your will, as a matter of your worship, not because you have to, not because we're checking, but as a matter of your will, as a matter of your worship, that you say, without what I've earned in my, my, with all of my work hours this week, I'm going to take 10% of that and bring it to the house of God. People will say, well, the law, you know, that goes with the law, and it was in the law. The law's passed away. But this predated the law. It existed well before the law, and it existed in this form that it was an act of worship. Truthfully, it really even existed, I believe, with Cain and Abel. Going even further back, 10%. That's just a sidebar. The writer of Hebrews is coming for the priesthood. Now consider that for a minute. For Jewish worshipers, Jewish Christians, these are believers in Christ, but who are also observant Jews, these Jewish Christians with their system of worship based on the priesthood, the writer of Hebrews is getting ready to challenge them on their religion. That's what makes this meat. It's not meat because it's so hard to understand. It's not meat because, well, you know, let's make sure that you've really, I mean, if, if you haven't been to divinity school, then maybe you won't get this or anything. like. It's not complicated. It's just hard to accept. He's coming for their religion. And if you're guessing where we're going today, he's coming for our religion too. <laughs> he said in verse 5, Now the law of Moses required that the priests, who are descendants of Levi, must collect a tithe from the rest of the people of Israel. That tithe is 10%. This is where it is in the law. He's referencing the law. And that these descendants of Levi are also descendants of Abraham. All right? So priests who were the leaders of this religion, this system of Jewish worship, the priests who were the leaders of this religion were required to be descendants of Levi. Levi was a person, a man. They were required to be descendants of Levi or they were ineligible to serve as priests. Now, the writer of Hebrews is making a case that Melchizedek is a, is a priestly order that is superior to the priestly order of their worship. This worship system had been in place for hundreds of years. This system of worship had been in place for a long time, but to be a priest in that system, you had to be a descendant of Levi. And the question is, is the priesthood that we see in Genesis from Melchizedek, is that priesthood superior to the priesthood that they were experiencing in their Jewish worship? It was a different priesthood. Is it superior to the priesthood they were experiencing? 
And he says, well, let's, let's look at it. These priests have to be descendants of Levi. Levi was a son of Jacob. Jacob was a son of Isaac. Isaac was a son of Abraham. So going back to Abraham, these were Abraham's great-grandchildren. Levi was a great-grandchild of Abraham. And Levi's descendants also then are descendants of Abraham. You had to be in that family. You had to be a descendant of Levi, who was a descendant of Jacob, who was a descendant of Isaac, a son of Isaac, son of Abraham, to be eligible. So this account that we read about Abraham having an encounter with Melchizedek thousands of years earlier happened before this priesthood that they were experiencing on a regular basis even existed at all. So it was first. It was before. You with me so far? This priesthood existed before. He says in verse 6, Melchizedek, who was not a descendant of Levi. So ineligible for this Jewish priesthood. Melchizedek, who was not a descendant of Levi, collected a tenth from Abraham. So you catch this imagery of what's happening. And Melchizedek placed a blessing on Abraham, the one, Abraham, who had already received the promises of God. And without question, the person who has the power to give a blessing is greater than the one who is blessed. In other words, the image is this, that if, if Melchizedek is here being meeting with Abraham and Abraham is bringing this offering and offering it up to Melchizedek Abraham is on his own recognizing that there was something preeminent there was something other than bigger than about Melchizedek at that time so the order is that Abraham's here bringing his offering to Melchizedek Melchizedek is here receiving that offering and blessing Abraham and so the writer of Hebrews is explicitly saying the person giving the blessing is greater than the person receiving the blessing now he's coming for their religion he said the priests who collect tithes this is verse 8 now he's talking about their priesthood now your priests in the temple who collect tithes are men who die they're, just, they're men who die. So Melchizedek is greater than they are because we're told that he lives on. In addition, we might even say that these Levites, the ones who collect the tithe, that these Levites who are collecting the tithe in your system themselves paid a tithe to Melchizedek when their ancestor Abraham paid a tithe to him. For although Levi wasn't born yet, the seed from which he came was in Abraham's body when Melchizedek collected the tithe from him. So not only is Melchizedek here and Abraham's here bringing his gift and receiving his blessing, but Isaac is here and Jacob is here and Levi is here and everyone else that would follow in that line, they are all here recognizing the superiority of the priesthood of Melchizedek whose name meant, meant king of justice and who is referenced as the king of Salem, the king of Shalom, the prince of peace. He says in verse 11, so if the priesthood of Levi, the current system of worship that they were in, their religion, if the priesthood of Levi on which the law was based could have achieved the perfection God intended, why did God need to establish a different priesthood with a priest in the order of Melchizedek instead of the order of Levi and Aaron? If that system, if your religious system of worship could achieve the ultimate spiritual end, if it could get you there, if that would work, why did we need now another priest? He's not talking about Melchizedek now. He's talking about Christ who is in the order of Melchizedek. He's saying here is one like Melchizedek who has no, 
no uh, an ancestry that goes back for eternity past. Here is one whose future goes for an eternity future. Here is one that is transcendent. He does not die like these earthly human priests that you have. Why did we need a priest like Christ in the order of Melchizedek if the priesthood of Aaron and Levi were enough all by themselves? If it could achieve that, why did we need him? That's something that potentially a Jewish worshiper would choke on. They might say, man, I was willing to, I was willing to accept Christ as long as I could have Christ and what I already had. If I could have Christ and, then I was on board. If Christ was just a convenient add-on, no problem. I've got room. There's always room for one more good author. There's always room for one more good podcast. I mean, yeah, I'd be glad to, to put him in, my, in the mix of what it is that I've got going on spiritually. No problem. If I can have him, if I can just add him. But he's saying, man, if that bag of tricks that you had was enough... By itself, why do we need him? And then look at verse 15 of chapter 7. It says, This change has been made very clear since a different priest who is like Melchizedek has appeared. What we're just talking about. Jesus became a priest not by meeting the physical requirement of belonging to the tribe of Levi, but by the power of a life that cannot be destroyed. How about that? Jesus wasn't even a member of the tribe of Levi, by the way, and he references that later in this passage. But he's, he's a member of the tribe of Judah. He is referred to as the lion of the tribe of Judah. Judah is the ruling tribe. The kings came from the tribe of Judah. So Jesus now from the tribe of Judah is this new kind of priest who's not just a priest, but he's also a king at the same time. It's a new kind of priesthood. I want... Kids, you know the story of David when he fought Goliath. Raise your hand, students, if you know that story. David and Goliath. Yeah, yeah, I see all these hands. That's good. Adults, David and Goliath. David and... David shows up at this battle. They've been out there for weeks and weeks. Two armies on opposite hills. The Philistine army has a champion who is a giant... He's a, he's a big dude, man. Nine feet tall, Goliath. And he goes out every day and he issues a challenge saying, hey, no need for us all to fight, no big deal. I'll just fight any one of you that you choose and whoever wins that fight will, will submit, the other side will submit. Easy. One person will die instead of a bunch of people will fight this battle. And everyone on the, on the Israel side was afraid to go fight. And so David shows up, not even to fight, but just to check on his brother's because his dad had sent him with some snacks for them. He shows up and says, what's going on? What's all the hollering about? And they explain to him what's happening. And he said, well, I'll go fight him. And they said, you know, there's some, you know, they're making fun of him and, you know, that kind of thing. And, and, uh, but eventually they bring him to King Saul. They have no other takers. And David said, listen, when I was out guarding the sheep, a bear came up. I killed him. When I was out tending the sheep, a lion came up. I killed him. I, I don't. I don't have an issue fighting this, facing this giant. We're, just point me in the right direction. We'll go get it done. Saul then agrees, the king, King Saul agrees then to let David fight him. But do you remember what happened next? He says, let me get my stuff. Let me get my armor and, and put it on you so that you can be protected, so that you can have what you need. This battle that you're going to fight, you're going to need these things, David. You don't know put these things on of course david's uh, probably about a 15 year old how many got 15 year olds here today are we close what are you about to be yeah so he's probably 15 saul is not only a man but he's a tall man the scriptures tell us he's got his armor that's been custom made from he thinks he's honoring david he thinks he's helping david david if you'll just attend my sunday school class put my armor on if you'll just jump through this hoop, if you'll just act and behave in the way that we expect, 
If you dress the way, literally, that I expect you to dress when you go into battle, you'll do a lot better. And so they just put all this stuff on him. You can see them just helping him. He doesn't know. And he's just covered up in armor. He can barely move. It's heavy. It's too big. And the thing that was being offered to him to help him was actually the thing that was going to cause him to get killed. David said, I can't do battle in all of this. Tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to face this giant the same way I faced the lion and the bear. Get this off of me. I've got to have some room to breathe. Let me go down to the brook. I'm going to pick out some ammunition. I'm going to put it in my pouch. And then I'm going to go out and face him. That's what we do with our religious systems. We place these burdens on people that they can barely walk under. Burdens that they can barely understand. Now for Saul, a man who was the size that would fit that, the man who understood how those things worked, maybe there was some benefit for him. But we place these burdens on people. Jesus said to the Pharisees, you place burdens on people that you're not even willing to follow yourself. And you keep people away from the kingdom of God when you do that. That's what Jesus said. The writer of Hebrews is saying to us, our religion is not enough. What is that, Pastor Dennis? What, what is our religion? I would suggest that it's, that it's all of the trappings, probably most of which there's nothing wrong with them in and of themselves. Did you hear me? This, this sacred desk is a traditional piece of furniture behind which a preacher would share a sermon like I am today. But it's just part of our religious system. It's, this, is, this is not necessary. I wouldn't have to be behind this desk. We've talked about this issue before, if you've been here long enough. I don't have to be behind this desk to share the truth of God's Word. The idea is that I would share the truth of God's Word. I don't have to be in a room that looks like this to share the truth of God's Word. The idea is that I share the truth of God's Word. We don't have to be in a building that has a steeple on it to enjoy the truth of God's Word. It's okay to be in a building with a steeple on it to enjoy the truth of God's Word. Thank God for a beautiful place to worship, a place that we've set apart and said, hey, we're willing to put our resources into a place where people can come and encounter Christ and be trained and grow and live and die. Thank God for a place. But it doesn't have to look like this to be a place where God shows up. And that's what happens when we begin to put those things on. We begin to think that that's where the power is. We think it's in that building or it's in that steeple or it's in that organ or that type of organ or that type of desk or, or maybe if I didn't have a jacket on or, or, or whatever it is. And it's not all just church. Our religious systems sink deep into who we are and how we are. The point of the book of Hebrews is to understand that Christ is greater than our religion. Cristo es más grande que nuestra religión. He is greater. He is great. We love these things. There's no harm in them for the most part. We love our trappings, the ceremonies, the look, the feel, sometimes the smell, the, the space. We even used to sing a song that said, Just... Give me that old-time religion. It's good enough for me. But with all due respect to whoever that songwriter was, it is not good enough. It's not. Our religion is not enough. And here's the thing. I think it's easier to see it in other groups than it is to see it in our own. <laughs> now, if I were to say, listen, the Episcopalians, just, just raise your hand if I hit you this morning, Episcopalians. I don't know. 
Probably not more than one or two at best. All right, woo! <laughs> she said former. <laughs> man, we can sure see it in the Episcopalians, how, we, how they let their religion get in the way. I mean, man, I mean, they're just the worst, aren't they? I trust we still have no sound. <laughs> I mean, the Lutherans, we can, we can figure, man, they do everything in community. Don't they understand that this is a personal relationship with Christ? I had a Lutheran person, a friend of mine, brother in Christ, tell me one time about their new pastor at the Lutheran church. He said, this new pastor is bound and determined to make this a personal relationship with Christ kind of thing. <laughs> oh, I know we laugh. It's like, oh, man, those Lutherans. I mean, as close as we are sort of genetically, evangelically, even the Baptists, and we probably got some Baptists, the people, how many Baptists, former Baptists we have in here this morning? I mean, man, praise God, yeah. We're in a Baptist world right here. But we can, we can look, but it's hard, it's like this big, giant, religious case of the, the log in your own eye and the, and the speck in your brother's eye. Man, I can see an Episcopal speck from a mile away. But can I see an Assembly of God speck? Can I see a Pentecostal speck? Can I see a First Assembly of God of Gastonia log in our corporate religious eye or am I too busy seeing where the lack is in every other religious system? And the truth is, the writer of Hebrews is just saying, no matter what the religious system, he's speaking to Jewish worshipers in this letter, but he's really saying that your religious system is not enough to get you there. If it was, we could follow that system all the way to success. It's not enough. That's why we needed a different kind of priest, a different kind of representative, one who was enough he said in verse 18 and it's not on the slides yes the old requirement about the priesthood was set aside because it was weak and useless for the law never made anything perfect but now we have confidence in a better hope through which we draw near to God amen he said in verse 23 there were many priests under the old system listen think about that phrase there were many priests under the old system and apply that to whatever our context is what are the priests what are the many priests what are the many ways we try to get there through our own system there were many priests under the old system for death prevented them from remaining in office. But because Jesus lives forever, his priesthood lasts forever. Therefore, he is able once and forever to save those who come to God through him. He lives forever to intercede with God on their behalf. Verse 26, he is the kind of high priest we need. That's what he said. He is the kind of high priest we need because he is holy and blameless, unstained by sin. He has been set apart from sinners and has been given the highest place of honor in heaven. Unlike those other high priests, and if you'll allow me, unlike those other religious things, unlike those other trappings, unlike those other traditions that we have become so fond of, unlike those things, he does not need to offer sacrifices every day. They did this, those priests, did this for their own sins first and then for the sins of the people. But Jesus did this once for all. Once for all. When he offered himself as the sacrifice for the people's sins. The law appointed high priests who were limited by human weakness. But after the law was given, God appointed his son with an oath. And his son has been made the perfect high priest forever. And Pastor Derwin, you can come. This is meat not because it's complicated, but because we don't like people messing with our stuff. This is about, this is about Jesus Christ. He is the all-sufficient one. And I love 
I, honestly, I, I do love religious things. I really do. I, I'll be honest. I love them. I, 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 love, I love them in, in just about every stripe. I mean, I really do. I, I love this Hammond organ that, man, Carol just, ah, uh, Carol, I was talking to her yesterday. Her technique on this is just, she's a, she's a player. She can, really, she can really do it. I love Hammond organ. In fact, about 17 years ago, I brought this one out of mothballs and asked her to play it. Love Hammond organ, but I'm telling you what, all, I, I love a giant pipe organ too. I do. Oh, love that stuff. I love, I love those things. I, I love the, I love it. We don't have to throw it all away. He's not saying that. He's just saying it's not what's going to get you saved. He's saying that's not what's going to sustain you. I've never heard one person on their deathbed say anything about a, a church steeple or, or a church organ or the furniture in a church or what they did on the first Sunday or the fourth Sunday of the month or you know what they're doing? Believers? Believers? A lot of times they're getting a little peek through the veil. You remember last week he said, you go in there, go into that most holy place. He's opened it up. We can go there and we'll find Jesus already there waiting for us. That's what comes into view. Dress, dress up, man. Dress, dress up for church. I love it. You don't have to. You don't have to, but I, I do. I love, I love that. I didn't wear this jacket today because I had to. But I, I, I wanted to. Doesn't make me any anything more spiritual or more blessed. I just I just like it. And it's okay. But when I get here, if I'm thinking about my jacket or somebody else's jacket or somebody else's lack of a jacket or anything else other than the person of Jesus Christ, then I've lost my way. We've missed it. We've missed it. Those things are never going to sustain us in our toughest moments. <laughs> some of you have experienced sickness over these last couple of years at some point. Some tough, there were some tough nights. You know what you probably were doing? You were probably laying there calling on Jesus. You know who came and helped you? Jesus. Some of you have gone through some terrible grief over these past couple of years. You know what you were doing in that moment of grief? Uh, you weren't calling on your tra tradition. You weren't calling on your religious system. No, no. You were calling on the name of Jesus. Come help me. Come help me. That's what the writer of Hebrews is saying to us. That, that religious system is fully formed. It's very developed. It's big. It's strong. It's rich. But don't miss Jesus because you're around Jesus y things. It's Jesus. It's Him. He is the one that is able to keep us. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. The book of Revelation said He is the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. That's who we're talking about. Isn't that something? Oh, it's not hard to understand. Every child in this room can understand what I'm saying this morning. It's not hard to understand. Just sometimes it's hard to accept. It's hard to accept. This morning, if you'll just stand with me, I'm going to ask you, no matter what your age, if you're a child or if you're an adult, it doesn't matter. If you've never said yes to a relationship with Jesus Christ, just lift your hand. Let me see you. I see you up there, honey. I see you. Who else? You know how to have a relationship with Jesus, girls? You just talk to him. I'm going to pray in just a minute, and you can pray with me. But you just talk to him. And you say, and he'll hear you. Even though you don't see him standing here the way you see me, Jesus will hear you, and he'll be in your life. Say, Lord, I want Jesus 
who am calling, Lord Jesus, I want you in my life. I want you to help me. I want you to forgive me of everything wrong in my life. And I want you to walk with me, show me the way. Would you pray with me that way? All right. Lord Jesus, we pray together in this very special moment. We pray together and say, Lord, come in. Forgive us. Make us right with you. Come be our friend. Walk with us. Show us the way. And Lord, we know that if we pray this way, that you do come right on in and you walk with us. So Lord, for these children that I've just prayed with that are in the balcony right now, God, I pray that you would that you would meet them in this moment. Reveal yourself to them, Lord. When they go back home today, reveal yourself to them. Walk with them. Help them at school. Help them at home. It's hard sometimes. Help them, Lord, I pray. And we say thank you for it. But God, we celebrate you. We celebrate you. And before we leave here today, Lord, we're going to worship with this very simple song. Lead us, Pastor. Jesus. Come on, sing it out. Sing it out. Jesus. Jesus. There's just something about that name. Master, Savior, Jesus, like the fragrance after the sing it one more time. Maybe lift a hand to heaven if you feel comfortable. Jesus. Only you can sing it for you. Jesus. Jesus. There's just something about that name. Master. Like the fragrance after the rain, Jesus, 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 let all heaven and earth proclaim. Away, but there's something about that name. So, Lord, we stand here in this place and we make that confession. There's something about your name, the name by which anyone can be saved. We say thank you, God. Thank you that you've made it that simple. And that you've made it that accessible that literally anyone can reach it. Whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. We say thank you for that. We say thank you for that. So Lord, even though we've said it many other times, we say today we, we want to receive you and we want you to receive us. 
we walk in relationship with you. May we never be blinded or distracted, Lord, by religious systems, tools that may be helpful in some context, but may they never obscure our view of who it is that we worship, who it is that we're walking with, who it is that's going to see us home. The one. The one. We say thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask Pastor Jared to come um, and tell you a little bit about what our students are doing, our kids, and give you an opportunity to worship one more time on your way out today. And then I'll come back and we'll do our declaration together. Pastor Jared. Amen. Well, I'll tell you what, we have had a jam-packed day, have we not? Can we give God thanks for just the wonderful day we've had with him this morning? Um, I don't know if you want to sit now or not, so I'm going to let you just do this or that. Okay, y'all can stand. Um, so I'm going to be a long time then. <laughs> um, many of you uh, may have heard, but if you haven't, I want to make sure you know about a program our kids participate in called BGMC. Um, it's a program that is ran uh, within the Assemblies of God, and today is actually National BGMC Day. And so all across the country, churches are taking collections for BGMC. Now, what is BGMC? It stands for Boys and Girls Missionary Challenge, okay? And uh, what's unique about BGMC is that it is a dedicated fund that goes to whatever crazy need a missionary may have. It's not specific to vehicles like the great work that Speed the Light does. It's, it could be anything. Um, my favorite story is of a, a jail, a women's jail, where if dad's not in the picture and mom goes to jail, the kids have to live in jail with mom. Um, and so BGMC built a day center right next to the jail so that the kids can come out um, during the day and, and, and not spend their, their days in prison. Um, but with today being National BGMC Day and the crisis that's going on in Ukraine, BGMC is partnering with Convoy of Hope uh, to aid refugees looking to escape the violence that's happening um, in, there in Europe. And so on the way out, I've asked some friends to be holding a buddy barrel. This is what kids collect in uh, week to week. Um, you may find a child standing at the doors holding a barrel out. If you would like to contribute uh, and help these kids raise money for BGNC, specifically in the month of March for the Ukrainian crisis, they'll be there at the door on your way out. Um, and you're going to have to walk past a small child and say, no, I'm not helping you in the missionary. So, so if you can live with that on your conscience, then we, we'll meet you in the altar after service. But... <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, we are very blessed here to be able to worship with the freedom that we had and the problems that many of us may have had this week pale in comparison to what's going on in Ukraine. So I encourage you, if you've got some change in your pocket, or if you've got a Benjamin in your pocket, um, place that in one of these buddy barrels. Kids, if you would like a Convoy of Hope truck to raise money in, I've got them. They're not folded up in the uh, first at home center on your way out the door. And I'll turn it over to Pastor Dennis. All right, I see you guys borrowing from each other right now just so you won't be shamed. Man, what a great day. What a great day. Thank you for being here. Can we make our commitment, our declaration? May the words of our mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Psalm 19, 14. I love you, First Assembly. Go with God. I love you, kids. Thank you all for being here today.